So yeah, I'm real excited about jumping into the, uh, this new series. We're going through the book of Titus together. And <laughs> Thank you. I love a guy who just goes with it, right? Yeah. I, I'm excited. You know, it's interesting. I, I've had so much um, feedback from, from everybody so excited about the fact that we're going to be going through the book of Revelation together. I feel like I don't know, the, the bar has been set really high and uh, in and of my own strength, I've got no way of, of, of surmounting that thing. And so I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit to uh, do what, what I can never do anyway on my own. Uh, but I'm excited about going into uh, this study together. I got to confess, um, in 22 years of ministry, other than, I mean, it's been times I've preached out of the book of Revelation, but I've never preached through the book of Revelation um, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And uh, it's interesting in speaking with a bunch of friends of mine that are pastors and telling them, yeah, we're going to be jumping into the book of Revelation like you're crazy, really? And I was like, well, you know, and I'm looking around like, I can't find many people. It's interesting, you can find one of two people. Somebody who either never addresses it or someone who that's all they ever talk about is the book of Revelation and they've got all the, the charts and the, every, it all figured out already. And to them, it's not a revelation. They got it all kind of figured out. I don't know. But um, that's certainly not been the way it's um, has been my story. But I'm looking forward to kind of diving into this this passage uh, and, and this, this text these next number of weeks. I, I find that what's true of churches, of, of pastors, is true of church members as well. Um, interestingly, how many have you have come to Christ in the first place you went was the book of Revelation? Um, it was kind of like, all right, I'm going to figure out this whole Christianity thing. It's kind of like, what's with the bulls and the incense and the beast and all this? Like, what's going on? What did I sign up for? You know, and then they get in the faith for any length of time. And then they look and go, I don't know if I could ever figure this out. And so we're just going to kind of ignore the book of Revelation. And that's certainly not the response. I think sometimes people will avoid the book of Revelation for fear that it'll so shake their faith because they can't connect the dots. And that's never a good reason to ignore the book. I've always kind of um, said, well, you know, what we'll do is when I run out of things that are really clear in the scripture to teach, we'll jump into the book of Revelation. And um, I've got to confess that was um, not a good response either. And so um, there is a lot that is very clear in the book of Revelation. And the reason it has become muddied over the years is there's so much opinion that's out there and there's so many people who have written and redefined and, and wrongly interpreted the book of Revelation that there's so much out there that it really has muddied the waters. And, and um, this is the word of Almighty God and we need to give it its due diligence and application to our lives. And so... Um, let me just say, uh, this morning we're going to spend a lot on um, context and introduction. It's important for us to kind of understand how we're going to interpret the book of Revelation. We're certainly going to jump into the text, but I want to give you an idea of where and how we're going to be uh, beginning this journey uh, through uh, Revelation. Uh, within the book of Revelation, we'll find a lot of symbolism within the book. Um, we'll see a lot of graphic imagery and and things that are yet to be understood because they haven't happened yet. That's going to be a very key thing for us to understand. There are going to be things in the book of Revelation that are yet to be understood because they haven't happened yet. The challenge is to make sure that we're not connecting dots that aren't for us to connect. There are some things in Revelation that are, that are yet to be revealed. And listen, we need to be okay with that. And we need to be okay with the fact that some dots are yet to be revealed to us. And now let me just say a couple of things here. Um, there, there, there are things that we're going to look at in the book of Revelation that, that we'll, um, we'll look at this and it's not going to, we're going to have a hard time knowing where to place this because we have nothing to compare it to. It's going to come across as new to us, but listen, it's not new revelation. It's just new to us. What has been prophesied and talked about has not intersected with time yet. And so what ends up happening is when what is spoken about in the scripture hasn't intersected with time yet, we need to be okay with the fact that saying, I don't know how that's going to play out, but God is in control. You know, it's taken me a long time to be okay with the fact that I don't know the answer to everything. 
I know that might sound really, you know, like I, I know you're laughing at me, but you're, you're right. It's like, there's like, who, who, like there's, there are some things that God has not yet chosen to reveal to us. Not that, this is really key, not that there's any new revelation outside the word of God. Do you, do you understand that there's no new, it drives me crazy, just as a side note, it drives me crazy when people say I've got a new revelation. There's, there's no new revelation. Everything you might have been, uh, like you might have been uh, uh, enlightened or brought in on an existing revelation, but there's no new revelation. What we see here in the book of Revelation are things that are yet to come, and when those things intersect with time and become a reality, it will not be new revelation. It will be new to us if we're here for it, and it will be revealed revelation. Let me give you a couple examples of that because this is foundational to how we're going to understand the book of Revelation because what happens too many times is when things aren't that clear, people feel the need to fill in blanks and connect dots. And that's where we get all these crazy understandings of the book of Revelation. A couple examples, if you, if you consider the book of Job, now Job was perhaps um, um, the, the first of the, uh, the texts that we have, the oldest of scriptures in the Old Testament. And um, he writes in Job chapter 36 and verse 27, he says, for he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist in the rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. And so basically what he's doing is, is he's looking out side like we have right now, and we're seeing the rain come down upon the earth. And what's interesting here is he's kind of laying out for us something that we've come to know as the hydro hydrological cycle. I made a mistake in the first service. I called it the hydraulic cycle <laughs> and, and didn't even have an opportunity to correct that and uh, didn't realize I said that. And like, no, that's in my truck. And this is like, this is our science, right? And so <laughs> the hydrological cycle is, is where the rain comes down, it evaporates, it comes back down again. And see what we see Job talking about in Job chapter 36 is he gives us a picture of the hydrological cycle. What's interesting is the hydro hydrological cycle wasn't revealed or understood or defined until 1674. And so the hydrological cycle didn't come into, be into being or become new revelation in 1674. It was revealed to us, but the truth of it is, it was laid out for us in the sacred text of scripture centuries and centuries before, but there was a point at which in 1674 that that reality intersected with times and we could define it now and we just call it the hydrological cycle. The same can be said for the over 400 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. I mean, think about it. I mean, in Genesis chapter three, where God talks about, you know, the, the one who's gonna come and crush the head of the serpent. He will bruise your heel, but you shall crush his head. You're thinking, now, now we have the luxury of hindsight. We know that's referring to who? Jesus, right? Well, like, but not that we're such great theologians, but the reality is we are experiencing that or looking that through the lens of hindsight. We know what took place. But for Moses and for those in the, you know, those in, in, in the Old Testament, they had no idea specifically what that was referring to. And you think about all of the, all of the, the prophecies that pointed to the Messiah and the, the systems and, 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 and the symbolism and, and the types and, and all those things, they really didn't kind of understand the, the fact that God was gonna step out of eternity and into time in the, in the person of Jesus Christ and, and give his life for us on the cross by paying the price for our sins. We can embrace that and say, yeah, that makes total sense. But in the Old Testament, Testament, it hadn't happened yet. And so the prophecies hadn't intersected with time yet. And so it was not a clear understanding. Peter gives us a, a, a beautiful picture of this same reality. First Peter chapter one, Peter writes this. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was, your, that was to be yours, these prophets, they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you 
and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things that even angels long to look. What is Peter saying here? He's saying the prophets of old, they wrote about and talked about the one who was going to come, but it says they searched and inquired carefully and wondering what is it going to look like? How is this going to play out? And then it was revealed to them, this wasn't for them, this was for us who are on the other side of the, of the, of the covenant, right? On the other side of Christ's coming. It makes sense to us, but for them, they didn't understand because what they prophesied about hadn't intersected with time yet. And it's so it wasn't, it didn't become a reality. It wasn't, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't clear to them, it didn't make sense to them. And likewise, when we, as we delve into the book of Revelation, there are some things that will make sense to us, but there's some other things that are yet to come that we gotta look back and in the same way that Peter said it wasn't for them, well, some of this might not be for some of us. Some of this is gonna take place after our death. Some of this might take place, you know, wh whenever. And so, but it will take place. And there'll be a time that everything John writes about in the book of Revelation will in fact intersect with time and will make all the sense in the world. Yeah, but there's some really crazy things that are in there. Yeah, as crazy as God stepping out of time into eternity and taking upon himself all the sin of the world. I mean, let's, let's just, does that seem really far-fetched if, if, you, if you really got honest about it? Like, because how in the world does that play out? And yet, because we have the luxury of hindsight, that is something that we hold with such affection and, and appreciation. So as we approach the book of Revelation, um, I want to say from the outset that some of what it contains is yet to be understood by us as it awaits its intersection with time. There are differing views on how to interpret the book of Revelation. I want to take a moment and I want to, I want to share with you some of the the ways in which people have interpreted the book of Revelation. I'll highlight what the four of them are, and then I'll, I'll share with you um, what mine is and, and why. But there are basically four interpretive schools of thought when it comes to uh, the subject of Revelation and how we are to interpret it. Uh, the first school of thought is what's called the preterist um, position. And, and the preterist, preterist position, many of those who are in reformed traditions and, and would, would uh, identify themselves as amillennial would come out of or branch out of the preterist position. And their, and their position would say that everything that the book of Revelation talks about took place up around AD 70, was finalized by AD 70 when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And so ultimately what, for those who are, that are preterists, what they're saying is that, that um, the book of Revelation is a history of what has taken place and not something that is to happen in the future. They're looking at it through the lens of hindsight and not recognizing that it is something that is yet to come. And so they, they, they would not suggest that there's a, a millennium that is coming to the earth. They would suggest that that is a spiritual thing that takes place, that Christ is currently, the millennium is actually taking place right now. Um, this position would suggest that, that God, um, because of Israel's disobedience, that God broke his covenant with Israel, and so he replaced them with the church. Replacement theology is certainly not something we hold to, but they would suggest that God does not have any, or Israel has no special place in God's future kingdom. Um, and yet, there, um, we'll, we'll dive into showing how that is certainly not the case. Um, then there's a historist, a historist position. Uh, this position looks over a timeline of church history that goes beyond AD 70, and they would suggest that all of the things that, that kind of taken, have taken place in the church, the persecution and, 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 and the different ways in which leaders rose up to try and to destroy the church, all of those things were kind of taking place um, already in time up until 70 and, and beyond. But the history first position suggests that it kind of has taken place already. Um, 
even beyond AD 70, unlike the preterists. The idealist position, this view interprets Revelation purely symbolically. Uh, that, it, that it's not referring to anything that is literally going to happen. It, it is, a, it is a, an allegory, it is a story, a, a parable in a sense of, of really a, a, a war between good and evil, between God and Satan, and everything that is in Revelation is, really didn't happen. It's just a, a story to help us to understand a bigger picture of, of good and evil and God and the devil and, and things like that. And so obviously that is is a, um, something we, you know, we, I, I personally would not hold to. Um, and then there's the futurist position. The futurist position. This view interprets Revelation, specifically Revelation chapter 4, verse, uh, chapter 4 to chapter 22, as a prophetic account of actual events that will take place in the future as the end draws near. And so Revelation chapter four, and I'll explain why we start there at chapter four, but the futurist position is that Revelation chapter four to chapter 22 depict for us events that are going to happen in our future. It is the view, this view that um, is, a, is the natural result of a straightforward reading of the book of Revelation. And that's a very important thing to understand because the reality of it is God gave us not commentaries. God gave us his, his, his holy word. Right? And, so, and so when we think about, the, when we think about God's word and we, we read through the scripture, if we were just to take somebody who never heard anything about the Bible before, about the book of Revelation and all the events, and we were to place them on an island untainted from everybody's uh, visions and charts and teachings and everything else and say, what did you come up with? They will, in fact, come up with a futurist position because that's the way the text is laid out. It doesn't depend upon man interpreting or inserting events to connect dots that God chose to not connect yet. Interestingly, let me just say, sadly, a lot of theology, that happens. Um, where, 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 where I think the longer people are in the faith, that's painting with a broad brush, but, but oftentimes what people will do is they'll, they'll look to the commentaries and the commentators instead of allowing the word of God to speak in the context in which it was. You know, you look at the, the, the preterist ones, the ones that, that kind of look at, and, at Israel and say, well, God clearly just disconnected with Israel because of their disobedience. Well, this position they held centuries ago because Israel wasn't a nation at that point. They couldn't imagine that Israel would possibly come back together again and that God would fulfill his, proper, his plan and purpose for Israel in, 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 that, in that time. And so there's so many factors that, that come into somebody's um, uh, theological uh, conclusions that we need to be, make sure that we allow the word of God to be the thing that informs us the most and we don't connect dots that can't be connected. The scripture is intended to be interpreted in, this, in the context that it's given. And we don't have the luxury of changing the way we interpret each book of the Bible. We can't say, well, we interpret John this way, Titus this way, Malachi this way. Oh, in Revelation, we do it this way. And then they don't do it that way. No, we, we don't, because then, then there's no standard, right? Then, then you can make everything say what you want it to do. There needs to be a consistent way in which we interpret Scripture. I think the reason that there are so many opinions on the book of Revelation is because there's so many people who, who read into and add to and take out of the text, text in an attempt to try and have it make sense to them. But the reality of it is, it's, it's not that Revelation doesn't make sense, it's just that it will present things that we've never experienced before. But when we try to make common things that are uncommon to us, we then take out of the original intent of what God uh, wanted us to get from the text. We need to be okay with saying, you know, it might be this, but we'll see. And we allow the word of God, we allow what God has written to intersect with time so that it can be revealed or not. One of the interesting, just as an example of that, the, the preterist position that suggests that everything in Revelation took place at the destruction of the temple in AD 70. The, the, the problem with that position is the book of Revelation was written around AD 90, 95. 
And so why would John write about this revelation of events that took place already in AD 70? Well, here's how they get past that hoop. They just say, well, the book of Revelation wasn't written in AD 90, it was written in AD 70. Now, there's no internal or external evidence at all that would suggest that as being a proper dating of that book, but that fits into the, what they're trying to communicate, and that's where the dangers come in. And so we need to be careful that we don't engage in interpretive acrobatics to try and get the scriptures say what we want it to say. Our approach over the next number of weeks will be to allow the text to be read in the order and the context in which it has been given to us. This is consistent with the way in which we are to interpret all the sacred texts that God has preserved for us to read. And so as we look at the book of Revelation, just a couple of qualifiers as we go forward. The book of Revelation is written by the apostle John. He is, he is the only of the apostles that walked with Jesus that is still alive up until this point. All of the others, save Judas, were, were taken out due to martyrdom. But John was not immune to persecution and suffering. He understood hardship, and he is actually in exile by Rome. He's been set aside on an island called Patmos, and he is there um, exiled from his, his countrymen and from his family because of his faith. Now, Patmos was a small and, and rocky, barren area that, that Rome would send their criminals to, and they would work in the, in the fields and the mines and, 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 have, and having to work there. That's where, that's where John was because he was a part of an illegal cult called Christianity. At least that's the way Rome viewed it. And so they would either kill people for their faith or they would, bang, they, they would uh, banish them off to places like Patmos. But John is in, um, on the island in Patmos in exile when he writes this book. It's interesting, it just, just as, a, as a side note that has nothing to do with um, Revelation. So John is, John is um, under house arrest, for lack of a better word. He's, he's in exile in Patmos and he, and he pens the book of Revelation. Many of the beautiful epistles that we draw from in the scripture were written by Paul when Paul also was in prison. You know, I just, I just find it interesting how God can take what seems to be the scariest, worst, and difficult times of our life, those times we might feel like I'm stuck and I've got no place to go, I'm in prison, and God uses that for his glory, because he has our undivided attention. And I just want to say, you know, you might sometimes feel like you're in a prison. And you know what? That might be your finest hour. And, and, and as we look at Paul's ministry and John's, and, and John's ministry, um, they ministered greatly to the people of their day, but they continue to preach to us today from their prison, prison cells. It's just a very, very interesting thought. But they, they, when we consider the book of, of, of Revelation, um, we see John, who's writing this, it's broken up really into, into three sections, and that becomes clear as we, as we kind of move into the book of Revelation. But um, John kind of breaks it up into three sections, the things that John has seen, the things that are, and the things that, we, that, that will soon take place. The things that have seen, which will take place in, in, John chap, in, in Revelation chapter one, he will provide for us the, the context um, of what John will be saying in the course of his book. And so we see that the, in the in first chapter, it deals with the things that John has seen. He highlights the revelation that he has seen. And then as we get to chapters two and three, John will address the things that are. And he will write to these seven churches, these seven literal churches that existed in his time that Jesus had a message for. And so he will address those, those seven churches in uh, Revelation chapter two and three. And it'll be very interesting to see that the, that the struggles and the challenges and the failures of those seven churches continue to be the obstacles that many of the churches have to face today and hinder the power that many churches should be experiencing. And so chapters two and three deal with the things that are, and then as we get to chapter four through chapter 22, then it comes to the, the things that are yet to be, the future events of what, the actual events that will take place in the future. And so we'll see that how, how that's broken up um, in the next number of weeks. 
Um, let me just highlight things we're going to do and things we're not going to do. Um, so for some, this will be encouraging. For some, it'll be like, oh, I was really hoping you were going to do this. And, and um, this will encourage some, discourage other, but that's my job, right? To, to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Um, and so now, here's, here's what we're going to do as we, as we kind of j- begin this journey going through Revelation. We're gonna, here's what we're going to do. We're going to examine this text in the context that it is written. We will interpret it the same way we interpret every other text of scripture, using the scripture to help us to understand the text. And we will hold to the same literal method of interpretation that we employ in every other area of scripture. The other approaches that I mentioned before of interpretation leave the meaning of revelation to human opinion, and it demands interpretive acrobatics. The futurist approach is the only interpretive method that takes the meaning of the book of Revelation as God gave it. And so that is the way in which we're going to deal with it. That's what we're going to do. What we're not going to do is we're not going to connect dots that cannot be connected in regards to trying to put um, the upcoming events that Revelation speaks about on timelines and try to determine when Jesus is coming back. Right, we're not gonna we're not gonna get involved in um, what I call newspaper exegesis, where we kind of take a look at all the events that are going on in the world and we, and and make solid declarations that this is in fact why we know that Jesus is coming back in this generation, in this time, in this time period. Now, listen, I think the Scripture gives us some really good indications of what to look for. Right, we'll get an idea of seeing, um, you know, especially when we consider what's going on with Israel and, and everything else. But we need to be careful to not draw conclusions and connect dots where we're not allowed to connect dots. Let me just say this. Every generation was convinced that they were the last generation. Every church generation was convinced that they would be there at the coming of Jesus. And so I I want to just have a healthy awareness that we are not to draw conclusions or connect dots on the grand timeline of what God is doing. We need to recognize, and there's certain signs that Jesus talks about in Matthew and other places that will let us know not about the rapture, but by the second coming. I want to tell you something. I'm not looking for the second coming. I'm looking for the rapture. Because, man, if I'm here for the second coming, that means I missed the rapture, and that's another whole set of problems, right? And so the scripture does give us some good indications of when the second coming is taking place, but the whole forward movement of the end times starts with the rapture. And so we're going to hold in proper tension the fact that at any moment, without anything else having to happen, Jesus can rapture the church. There is nothing that has to happen at this point in God's eschatological scheme in order for us to uh, be okay with God coming for his church. Everything, Everything the scripture points to as a timeline event is not referring to the rapture, it's referring to the second coming. Now, when we look at some of those things and we recognize that it might kind of raise our our eyebrows a little bit to help us think, wow, it seems like it's really close. but I hold that in proper aware attention with the fact that a lot of other people felt that same way centuries ago. And so we're going to hold in proper attention the fact that Jesus could come at any moment with the fact that we must be busy and occupy until he comes bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that does not know him, to those who have not yet embraced him. And we need to cease every moment that we have to bring the gospel to the world around us. We are not to just sit back and do nothing because Jesus is coming. No, because he is coming, we must occupy and be busy bringing the gospel to the world around us. And so we need to have a healthy uh, balance between those two things. I want, when that, when that trumpet sounds, when Christ comes for his church, and, and when, when Christ raptures his church, man, I'm hoping I'm preaching at that point, or I hope I'm sharing my faith with somebody at that point, or I hope I'm serving somebody at that point. I just hope I'm doing something productive at that moment. But at any moment, it can happen. Interestingly, the book of Revelation, unlike any other book, 
the reading of it and the application of it comes with a blessing. Revelation chapter one, verse three says this, blessed is the one who reads aloud, and I'm reading aloud to you, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written for the time is near. And so there's a, there's a blessing that comes with the hearing, the verbalizing, and the application of the book of Revelation. Isn't it interesting that this is the only, Bible, this is the only book in the Bible that that is said about? And Revelation is probably the most um, unpreached um, um, subject in the churches today. Very interesting. Last time I say this, that as, to help kind of inform the direction of our study, the, the book of Revelation is full of, of incredible imagery, of, of angelic interaction. We'll see the depravity of man on display. We'll see the forces of evil and we'll see the power of God. Hollywood could, can never properly capture the imagery of all that John saw on the island of Patmos. But Revelation is not about those things. Revelation is not about the end of the world. Revelation is not about the bowls or the incense or the plagues. Revelation is not about the death angel or the beast. It's not about the devil, the antichrist, or the false prophet. Revelation is not about the rapture, the tribulation, or the second coming. It is not about the lake of fire, the judgment seat. Revelation is not about the new heaven or the new earth or the new Jerusalem that will descend. All of these are spoken of in the text of Revelation and we'll seek to bring clarity to each and every one of those things, but, but that is not what Revelation is all about. Ultimately, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ to us. That is what Revelation is about. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a revelation of his power, a revelation of his person. It is a revelation of his authority and a revelation of his victory over death and sin and Satan and all that has fallen. Jesus is the hero of the journey through Revelation. We will not get stuck in the weeds and lost in the details and miss the majesty of who he is. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we will look at every aspect of this book through the lens of what does this reveal to us about my Jesus, about my powerful victor over everything that exists. Revelation has a lot of things that will stagger our mind and stretch our imagination, but they shallow in comparison to the awesomeness and majesty of who he is. And that will be the primary focus of our journey through Revelation, keeping with the intent of why it was given to us, the majesty of Jesus. We're not gonna drag our feet, nor will we rush through a text as we seek to receive the promised blessing that comes to those who read and hear and apply his words. And so let's take a look at Revelation chapter one as we, we begin our journey through the book of Revelation. Probably won't go as deep as you want us to today, but that'll make you come back next week. <laughs> Revelation chapter one and verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. 
What a great opening we see right in the beginning. There's so much that's kind of going on at this moment here. Uh, a couple of things first, as I just mentioned, the, the opening line of the book of Revelation, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. John lays out right in, the cent- right in the beginning for us the central figure, the central person of the whole book of Revelation, and in fact, the central person of all that exists, being Jesus Christ. And he says here that, that, that the rev- this revelation comes from God, right? In other words, God is the divine source of what John is about to write. He lays out for them, he puts authority behind what he's saying by saying, this is not what somebody else told me or another person. This isn't my idea or a result of you know, drinking something bad. This is something that God told me. God is the source of this book. And then interestingly, I I don't recall any other area in the scriptures that this would apply. It is the only book in the Bible that was delivered, the sources from God, but it's the only book in the Bible that was delivered by an angel to John. What he was to write down was delivered by an angel to John. I thought it was kind of interesting. John identifies himself as the author of this book, so it kind of removes the the question as to who really wrote it. John clearly is the author of this book. But something we we see that's pretty interesting here is that along with the blessing that comes upon those who who, who, um, uh, read it and those who hear it and those who apply it, we we see that there's a sense of, of urgency that takes place. He says, blessed are they, why? Because the time is near. You know, it's interesting. We, we, we can get so jaded by time because we are so limited by it. Doesn't it seem like, you know, and, and, and isn't it interesting how we get older, it seems like time goes faster and faster. It's kind of like the, the roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the quicker it goes, right? And, and, and so, you know, but, but it's like you tell a 15-year-old, you know, kid that, you know, they have to wait till their 16th birthday for their, to get their permit. That's like an eternity to them, you know? And, and for, for us, as, you know, as we're getting older, it's like a year goes by so, so quick. But even there, we're limited. So when we think about even the lifespan of a person as, we, as you kind of get older and start nearing that 50-year mark, you start realizing time really goes quick. And I know some of you are looking at me saying, yeah, wait till you hit 16, 70, and 80. And, and, and like, I, I can only imagine. Um, but when we compare our, our limited amount of time in contrast to eternity, time as we know it from when God spoke and created time till the end of time is going to be a blip in the screen and compared to eternity. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And so when John writes, the time is near. Yeah, he wrote that 2,000 years ago, but in contrast to everything else, the time is near. It's quick. Look with me, verse four. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, what a beautiful passage, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. He's writing here to the seven churches that are in Asia. He's, he's letting us know the immediate audience that he's writing to are these literal churches that actually existed at that time. Every, every book in the Bible has a, a, an immediate audience to whom they're writing to. It certainly applies to each and every one of us, but what helps us to understand the context of what's being written is we understand who's writing it and who they're writing it to. And so this letter, this, this revelation is revealed to the seven churches that are in Asia Minor as well as for all of us to, to read, on, read, in, read in on. 
We see a beautiful Trinitarian greeting that, that John lays out for us here in this, in this opening passage. He says, he, he mentions the, the one who is and who was and is, who is to come. He's referring to God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. And then he makes reference to the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who in the world are the seven spirits? Like, what is that, like three, seven, seven holy spirits? What? No, that's referring to the Holy Spirit. Seven is the number of completion. It is the totality of God's presence there. We have the, a picture of the triune God that is present at that moment. And so we see God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and then it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And so we see John is just, just adding to this revelation that this is the one who came and walked amongst you. And then interesting, I love, he says, to him who loves us. This is all about the fact that God loved us. And he freed us from our sins by his blood. He satisfied the just demands of a holy God by presenting not the blood of bulls and goats, as we learned recently, but by the blood of his son. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. It resulted in something, didn't it? He freed us from our sins by his blood and he made us a kingdom. Priest to his God and Father. But what John is saying here is that this one who came and freed us by his own blood changed the disposition that we had before God. We, as Peter will, will write about, we who were not a people are now the people of God. We who had not received mercy now have received mercy. And so John is identifying this group of people, this audience of people who are recipients of the blood of Jesus Christ, how many are in that company this morning as the redeemed of the Lord? Our disposition before God has changed. And then John begins to get the engine going. The introduction is over. And he says in verse seven, behold, he is coming with the clouds. He lays out for us this Trinitarian greeting of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then says, behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, every, even those who pierced him. And on all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. John opens up this next thought with the word, behold. He'll use this word 25 times in the book of Revelation. And it is used to, to, to arouse the mind and the heart and it's in such a way that it builds in a sense of anticipation for what is about to follow. As we go through the book of Revelation, we see these 25 times that this word behold is laid, for, laid out for us. It will take a moment of pause and recognize something big is about to be revealed. That's what behold is for. Behold is like, get ready for this. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Interestingly, even those who pierced him that day, every eye from the beginning of time till the end of time as we know it, every eye will see him. And then he says, even those who pierced him. Could you imagine being in that company? Like, oof. Every eye will see him from the beginning of time as we know it till the end of time as we know it. Verses seven and eight ultimately summarize 
the entirety of the book of Revelation. If we really want to kind of get a, just a quick summary of what the book of Revelation is, 7 and 8 really does a really great job of doing that. Jesus is like, I'm coming, and those who pierced me and didn't believe it are in for a surprise. I am the Alpha and the Omega is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. In other words, before and after me, there is nothing. And ultimately, Jesus is saying, I am the final authority. I am the one. I win. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who is and who was and is to come. As mentioned before, when we approach the book of Revelation, we must, we must see it through the lens of Christ, our victor. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The whole book of Revelation, if we were to really summarize it, is basically that. Christ came to redeem what was lost in the garden and he does it at the final end. And everything else is just the details of how that played out. But Christ is the one standing at the end. And you know, as we, as we consider these times in which we live, the scripture would suggest it's going to get worse and worse for the world but I believe the darkest times in the world will provide the greatest times for the church. Not the greatest comfort for the church, but the greatest impact for the church. Right? The greater the night, the greater the light. And I believe with all my heart that, that as, as our world begin, continues to spiral down, God's people will rise to the surface and the message we bring will be just the message the world needs to hear. Christ and him crucified. And so as we, as we delve into Revelation, somebody says, oh, that stuff just scares me. Nothing to be afraid of. Let me just kind of, like, we win at the end. We, I mean, I, 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 hate, I hate spoilers, but I'm gonna just, just let you know, we win at the end. That which God put in motion is completed. At no point does God not know what is about to happen. God is never caught by surprise. He's never needed to switch his plans. He never drops anybody. As Jude says, he, 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 now to him who's able to present us, he's going to do that as our great victor. And what we have in the book of Revelation is a glimpse of what the future holds for those who reject God. And we're gonna see Christ in his fullness to the degree that we can on this side of eternity. May God add his blessing and anointing to his word. Let's pray. Lord, thanks. Thank you that you've preserved this book for us to see you as the one who is and was and forever will be. Lord, sometimes we feel so limited, we feel so out of control, and yet we take a look at these words and we're reminded that you are sovereign over the world. You're sovereign over the universe. Nothing catches you by surprise, and we are yours and you love us. What greater comfort can a person have than knowing that the God of the universe loves us? I pray your blessing on, on your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to rightly divide the word of truth, apply it to our lives, and let that be the, the fuel that motivates us to go into all the world and make disciples, to occupy until you come. In Christ's name we pray, amen.